The righteousness of the law can be experienced by us who walk by the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, your righteousness is like the righteousness of the Old Testament law, only empowered by the Spirit of God. God's commands now have become something you can do. In the full sense, only Christ has fulfilled all of the law's requirements. But when you're in Christ, you can fulfill the law's requirements in Him. Before we came to know Christ, we were continually defeated by sin. When we came to know Christ, we received the indwelling Holy Spirit and were able to attain a standard we could never reach in our own strength. Listen to me. When you become a Christian, if you look back over your life after a few months, you should see a different person than the person you were when you became a Christian. Someone gave me this little poetry that helps you understand what I've been trying to say. Here's what it says. To run and work, the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. But better news the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. Grace is not simply leniency when you have sinned. Grace is the power of God in you not to sin. So there you have it. The four things that are true of you, if you're a Christian, you are free from the penalty of sin. You are free from the power of sin. You are free from the punishment of sin. You are free from the practice of sin. Let me add this. When you get to heaven someday, you'll be free from the actual presence of sin. What a thing that is to look forward to. So, just let me give you two takeaways from this that you should apply to your life. Number one, start living forgiven. The Bible says no condemnation. Others, even our own self-talk, often say condemnation. Who are you going to believe? Are you not condemned or are you? Is there now no condemnation or is that not true? In the explicit gospel, Pastor Matt Chandler tells the story of driving through his hometown many years after he had left. As he drove into town, he paused as he passed a field where he once got into a fist fight with another kid. It was not a fair fight, and Matthew completely humiliated the kid in front of a large crowd of people. Then he drove past his first house and thought of all the wicked things he had done in that house. Next, he passed a friend's house where once at a party, he did some of the most shameful things he had ever done. Afterward, on the drive to a conference in which he was speaking, Matt was overwhelmed with the guilt and shame of the wickedness that he had done in that city before he became a Christian. He could hear the whispers in his heart, you call yourself a man of God? Are you going to stand in front of all these guys and tell them how to be men of God after all you've done? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And Matt said, in the middle of all that guilt and shame, I began to be reminded by the Scripture that old Matt Chandler was dead. I was the new Matt Chandler. The person who did those things, who sinned in those ways, was nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ. And all of his sins, past, present, and future, were paid for in full on the cross of Jesus Christ. I remember as a kid learning this verse in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. Why is that important? The Bible says that the old you has been crucified. Why? Because you're in Christ. Christ was crucified. You were in Christ when he was crucified. Your old you is dead. It is dead. And there's a new you, an uncondemned you. Start living like you're forgiven. Living like you're forgiven. Living every day like you're forgiven, because you are. Nobody can tell you different. Everybody can come and say, oh, yeah, but no. You, you don't have anything to remember except one thing. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Second takeaway. Start living forgiven and start living free. One day... Abraham Lincoln went to visit a slave auction. He was appalled at what he saw. 
his heart was especially drawn to a young slave girl whose story seemed to be told in the pain of her face. She looked with hatred and contempt on everyone around her. She had been used and abused all of her life, and this was but one more cruel humiliation for her. As the auction began, Lincoln offered his bid. As other amounts were bid, he countered with a larger amount until finally Abraham Lincoln won the bid for that girl, and he now owned her as his slave. When he paid the auctioneer the money and took title to the young woman, she stared at him with vicious contempt. She hated him like she had hated all of her other owners. She asked him what he was going to do next with her, and he said, I'm going to set you free. Free, she asked. Free for what? Just free, said Lincoln, completely free. Free to do whatever I want to do? Free to do whatever you want to do. Free to say whatever I want to say? Free to say whatever you want to say. Free to go wherever I want to go? Yes, free to go wherever you want to go. She said, then I'm going with you. <laughs> and that's the way it is when we're in Christ. When we're set free, it's not just to go do other things that we always thought. We, we're set free to walk after the one who set us free. We're set free to serve him and love him. That's the way it is. He sets us free to go anywhere we want to go, say anything we want to say, do anything we want to do. But because we have come to know him as the great freedom giver, we want to be where he is. We want to follow him. So we serve Jesus Christ not out of duty or responsibility, but out of love for the one who has set us free. Hallelujah. Today, if you hear my voice, please know, if you're a Christian, y y there's no condemnation. Now or ever, because the condemnation's already taken place. And the result of that is you are forgiven and you are free. And John 8:36 says this, therefore, if the Son makes you free, <laughs> You shall be free indeed. Say this with me. I am free indeed. I am free indeed. And you are. Dr. Jeremiah will return in a moment to close today's program right after this. Thank you for watching Turning Point. Dr. Jeremiah would like to offer you the written word journal, Romans, sent to you in appreciation of your gift of any amount in support of this program. And for a gift of $60 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will include his current teaching series, Romans 8, the greatest chapter in the Bible, on your choice of CD or DVD, and a correlating study guide. Or if you give it... Coming up on a special edition of Turning Point. Today, Dr. David Jeremiah addresses where we can go for shelter in the storms of life. Will there be storms along the journey? Certainly. Will our voyage be comfortable? We're learning right now that it's not comfortable all the time. No assurance that we will ever have a completely comfortable life. We might have to worry about seasickness, but what I'm here to tell you is you don't need to worry about drowning. We will get through the storms in our lives, and we will arrive where Jesus is taking us. That's coming up today on a special edition of Turning Point. In times like these, we often ask, why is this happening? When will everything go back to normal? And perhaps the most pressing question of all, where is God when it feels like everything is falling apart? In his book, Shelter in God, Your Refuge in Times of Trouble, Dr. David Jeremiah reminds you that even in periods of chaos, God is right beside you, exactly where he has always been and always will be. God is a fortress you can run to whenever you feel frustrated, uncertain or afraid, and he will always be enough. In this deeply personal book, Dr. Jeremiah draws inspiration from the Psalms to reveal God as a refuge during seasons of suffering. As you read, you'll learn how to shelter in his presence and power, even as you shelter in place. Request Shelter in God, your refuge in times of trouble for a gift of any amount in support of this program. When the Andrea Gale left Gloucester Harbor in Massachusetts on September the 20th, 1991, and headed into the North Atlantic, 
no one could have known that this fishing boat would never be seen again. Only a bit of debris ever turned up, and the six crew members vanished forever. In his book, The Perfect Storm, author Sebastian Junger immortalized the fate of the Andrea Gale. A film followed featuring George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg, but these stars, big as they are, played only supporting roles. The real star of the film was the storm itself, a terrifying, relentless oppressor born of fierce winds and mountainous waves. It was meteorologists who named this cataclysmic tempest the perfect storm. It is just a way of saying worst case scenario. In the case of the Andrea Gale, it was the simultaneous convergence of the toughest weather conditions possible. Three deadly elements came together in October of 1991. First of all, there was a front moving from Canada toward New England and a high pressure system building over Canada's east coast and the dying remnants of Hurricane Grace, all of them churning along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Strong weather was coming from three of the four points on the compass and all of it converging on the little Andrea Gale. The last radio transmission of Billy Tyne, the captain of the fishing boat, came at 6 p.m. on October 28, 1991. He reported his coordinates to the captain of his sister ship, the Hannah Bowden, saying, she's coming on, boys, and she's coming on strong. The popular book and the movie brought the term perfect storm into common use. But the concept is as old as humanity. People have always had to deal with the convergence of multiple rough circumstances. Today, in our faster, more crowded, and more complex world, a few little squalls can quickly become the perfect storm. And when multiple conditions converge and threaten critical areas of our lives, such as finances, relationships, jobs, and health, we question how much more we can endure. There is really no better term available to describe what we're going through right now. This is the ultimate perfect storm. We are in the midst of this storm, and it's very hard not to feel the clutches of fear that accompany a serious storm. The fate of the Andrea Gale demonstrates two kinds of fear that we all experience. The first is that gut-level adrenaline-drenched fear that the crew felt in the midst of the storm. They were afraid because their lives were on the line. This kind of fear is beneficial. It's a necessary instinct for survival. But there's another kind of fear that can immobilize us completely, and that's the fear of fear itself. Fear in the midst of the storm is instinctive and beneficial. Fear of a storm that could happen is not. We need a perspective on life that takes into account the perfect storms but also reassures us that there's a safe harbor within reach. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. As we follow him, as we become his disciples, our troubles look different in the light of his goodness and his power and his wisdom. What do we do when the perfect storm comes into our life? How do we manage when the winds of ill fate blow against us? Here from the life of Jesus is a perfect storm experience that will help us understand how we can deal with the storm we are facing right now. Our lesson begins with the probability of storms in our life, and our passage is in the book of Mark and the fourth chapter. When evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Uh, it is evening, and Jesus and his disciples are exhausted after a full day of ministry. Jesus' decision to cross from Capernaum to the other side of the Sea of Galilee is the only way he and his disciples can get away from the crowds. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was near exhaustion and his 12 disciples were reeling from the rigorous training he'd been giving to them. The crowds had been overwhelming, sick people, craving his healing touch, 
had flocked to Jesus on every street. Now Jesus was speaking near the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The crowds had begun to press in so hard that he was almost shoved back into the water, and he climbed into a boat and pushed out a few feet, and he sat down and continued teaching, according to the verse, verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. And by the time he had finished, it was evening. Desperately needing rest, Jesus and the disciples simply remained in the boat and set sail for the eastern shore where Jesus was to minister the next day. The elements of a perfect storm were gathering. I've been to Israel many times, and I can tell you from my own experience that the Sea of Galilee is like a bowl of water nestled nearly 700 feet below sea level. Mountains surround nearly every side of the sea, forming a valley and gullies that set the stage for howling winds and when the cool air from the mountains swoops through the valleys and collides with the warm, moist air hovering over the sea, violent storms can erupt in a matter of minutes. And that's just what happened. Mark 4.37 says, A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. The great windstorm, which arose on this particular day, could be described as a furious squall. Mark, in his gospel, uses a Greek word for the windstorm that is often translated hurricane. And Matthew describes the storm as a great seismos, or earthquake, like there was an earthquake in the middle of the lake and the shaking of the winds and, and the boat. This storm was so violent that the waves were breaking over the boat in which Jesus was with his disciples, and it was filling it up with water. And while the boat was filling with water, the hearts of the disciples were also filling up with fear. Just as sudden storms are inevitable on the Sea of Galilee, sudden storms can descend on our lives too. The coronavirus is our sudden storm. One day the sea was calm and we awoke on the next day and we were in the biggest storm any of us have ever experienced. The probability of storms in our lives. Let's notice, secondly, the paradox of storms in our lives. Here's an interesting thought from this story. At this time in their lives, the disciples were just following Jesus wherever he went, yet here they are being tossed up and down by a storm and in danger of drowning. They were in the middle of God's perfect will, and they were in the middle of a perfect storm all at the same time. They were about to learn a priceless lesson. And that is that storms are not always a punishment for lack of obedience. Sometimes they are the result of obedience. The disciples were not in the storm because they had done something wrong. They were in the storm because they were just doing something right. Those men were there because they had jumped in the boat when Jesus said, let's go. So there's a paradox here. Well, they didn't do anything wrong. They're in the midst of a storm. And some people would say, how does that work? So you see the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives. Let's notice third, the presence in the storms of our lives. Mark 4.38 says this, But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The disciples, you see, had yet to learn who Jesus was. If they had realized the full power and authority that Jesus held, they would have laughed and shouted at the wind. In the midst of the storm, there was a presence. Some people believe in the power of God, but they're not sure about the presence of God. This was the crisis the disciples faced. They knew that Jesus was there, but apparently they still didn't realize that he was God. This meant they were unaware of God's presence. So they didn't know what Jesus could and would do. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but they had not yet come to believe that Jesus was God. Remember, the twelve knew the story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but was that same God with them here and now? That was their question. They did not yet realize that Moses' God and their master were one and the same, and they truly had Emmanuel, God, with us in the boat where the storm had captured them. Incidentally, this is the only time in the Bible 
where we are told that Jesus slept, and he did it in the midst of a fierce storm. So that night on the Sea of Galilee, an exhausted Jesus slept on a cushion in the rear of the boat with the waves crashing all about him and his disciples in despair for their lives. So we have the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives and the presence in the storms of our lives, and now we come to the peace in the storms of our lives. Verse 39 says this, Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Mark tells us that Jesus rebuked the wind just as a parent would rebuke an unruly child. He dealt with demons in the same way when he rebuked them. And the wind obeyed him just as the demons did. This incredible display of miraculous power should have quelled any remaining doubts in the minds of the disciples as to who Jesus was. I mean, the Old Testament tells us that only God has power over nature. Psalm 89 verse 9 says, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 107 and verse 29 says, He calms the storm so that its waves are still. And that's what Jesus did in this storm. He he first brought peace to the circumstances around his disciples before he calmed their hearts. There was a calm around the disciples before there was a stillness inside the disciples. Aren't you thankful for the moments when he stills the storm and chaos around you while your emotions are running high? Our loving Heavenly Father is kind and patient with us when the storms of life overwhelm us and fill us with anxiety. We've experienced some of that in recent days. He's gracious to show us his power even when we're beginning to wonder if he's asleep or absent, even when our cries to him for help are permeated with doubt. But we can face whatever circumstances await us with courage if we just reflect on his faithfulness and place our confidence in his great power and loving purpose for our lives. Remember, men and women, that peace is not the absence of stress. Peace is the presence of the Savior. So you have the probability of storms in your life and the paradox of storms in your life and the presence of storms in your life and the peace in the storms in your life. But let's notice number five, the purpose of storms in our lives. And let's ask the question that's in the back of many of our minds. Did Jesus bring about this storm just so he could calm it and build his disciples' faith? No, no, he didn't do that. He had no need to create new storms to demonstrate his true nature because this fallen world stirs up enough storms without him having to do it specially. He builds our faith by using the storms that are already there. So I see no reason to believe that Jesus went to sleep for any other purpose than catch some much-needed rest. Yet he was quick to use the storm, wasn't he? As a teachable moment. The storm brought him their full attention, even as the coronavirus has brought us to attention. And the lesson would never be forgotten by those disciples, as I hope it will not soon be forgotten by us. Since we are human beings, I think I'm safe in saying that we have no shortage of storms in our lives. Not just the big one that we're going through now, but we live in a fallen world. And trouble of some kind is woven into the fabric of life. Until these storms hit, we live with the delusions of adequacy. But storms cut us down to size and cause us to fear what we cannot control. And although God does not create the storm in our life, he uses the churning seas to demonstrate his power and strengthen our faith in him. So Jesus allowed the winds to rage in order that his disciples would learn to trust him. And through the storms of life, our Lord teaches us many precious lessons. He reminds us of our own human emptiness, our own total dependence upon him. He teaches us to fear God with astonished reverence, not to fear the storms. The probability of storms in our lives. The paradox of storms in our lives. The presence in the storms of our lives, the peace in the storms of our lives, the purpose 
of storms in our lives and the product of storms in our lives. Once again, Mark chapter 4 and verse 40. Jesus said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, please notice, Jesus was a lot gentler with the disciples than he was with the wind. When he rebuked the wind, he only asked his disciples two questions. Why are you so fearful, and how is it that you have no faith? With these questions, Jesus reveals a spiritual truth, and that is that the opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. Belief breeds confidence, while unbelief breeds fear. Essentially, Jesus was saying, why are you afraid? Do you not yet trust God whose power is present in me? In the book of 1 Kings tells us about the prophet Elijah, who challenged the prophets of Baal to a duel of faith on top of Mount Carmel. From morning until noon, the prophets of Baal called upon their God to send down fire and consume the sacrifice on the altar, but nothing happened, not even a flicker. And Elijah mocked them with stinging sarcasm. In 1 Kings 18, 27, he says this, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. The disciples apparently assumed that Jesus was just as indifferent to their plight, so they cried, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Elijah's suggestion that Baal might have been asleep is precisely the complaint the disciples leveled at Jesus. You're sleeping, and we're drowning. Please, wake up. And what really intrigues me about this account is that Jesus replaced the disciples' fear with more fear. After staring in awe at the suddenly calm and windless sea, the Bible says they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Several Bible translations say they were terrified. They suddenly realized they were in the presence of a power they had never imagined could be in a person. And the power was mightier than the violence of a stormy sea. The disciples no longer worried about drowning. Now they were in awe of Jesus, and they felt a new sense of security in him. Debilitating fears were being replaced with the empowering fear of God, whom they dimly began to realize was with them in the presence of Jesus. As we review this story, which is familiar to most of us if we're readers of the Bible, we know the story. We know the story of Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat, but here are some takeaways from this story that are meant to help you and me as we negotiate our stormy time right now. First of all, God's Word alerts us to expect stormy seas. Men and women, the New Testament is salted with warnings about the stormy seas we face as followers of Jesus Christ. James writes in his book, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Peter writes in his book, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Jesus gave us the key to surviving storms in his story about two houses. Do you remember that? One built on the sand and the other on the rock. The sand represents the shallow, shifting, and unreliable values of worldly culture, and the rock represents the unshakable truth of God. As the storm rages, the first house quickly topples into the sand and washes out to sea, and the other stands firm, withstanding the force of the most violent winds. In decades of ministry, I have often seen the truth of this parable vividly demonstrated. People who place their trust in God withstand every storm because they have built their lives on the only foundation that cannot be moved. And people who do not do that crumble when the storms come. Let me just tell you, you shouldn't be surprised when storms come into your life because God told us it would happen. His Word alerts us to expect stormy seas. Secondly, God's Word announces that the Savior is on board. The disciples were too inexperienced with Jesus to have a faith devoid of fear. 
Perhaps you're the same way. You identify with Christ, but you draw no assurance as the clouds roll in and as the storm, the coronavirus storm continues. When the sky darkens, you might wonder whether you should step into the boat with Jesus or stay ashore in hopes of avoiding the storm. The problem with that choice is that it's a false one. You can't run. You can't hide. The storms will find you. You don't get to decide whether the rain is coming. You only get to decide whether to carry an umbrella. But he is sleeping, you say. He doesn't care. Don't let his seeming silence lead you to conclude that he isn't with you. Jesus says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in Matthew 28, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those are promises, and he has yet to break a promise. That he will be with you is the most certain fact of your life. What's uncertain is your grasp of that fact and your ability to trust and build your house upon that truth. It's the only storm-proof foundation in existence. And sometimes the rains will pound hard to drown out all other voices, and we struggle to hear Christ. But that doesn't mean he isn't calming the storm. The storms pass, and we hear the voice of God once again, this time through, a new wisdom tempered by our struggles and we realize that he was there all the time. God's word alerts us to expect stormy seas. God's word announces that the Savior is on board. And God's word affirms that faith drives out fear. When the terrified disciples awoke Jesus in the midst of the storm, he asked two critical questions. He said, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? And when the disciples stepped into the boat, they didn't trust in Jesus so that their fear escalated to terror when the storm came. But when Jesus awoke and calmed the storm, the dawning realization of who he really was ratcheted their faith to a whole new level. Later we learned that they became utterly fearless, proclaiming the truth of the kingdom in the face Are we living in the end times? There may have never been another time in history when end times prophecy has been more aligned with the culture and circumstances of the world than it is today. I believe there are 10 phenomena we are witnessing today that were recorded centuries ago in Bible prophecy. Seeing our circumstances in light of these prophecies should give us resolve, purpose, and hope. And help us answer the questions. What are we to do with the world around us? What hope do we have in times like these? And ultimately, where do we go from here? Is the indifference to God we're experiencing in the world today a sign we are living in the last days? The Bible teaches there will be a scarcity of truth in the end times. Could we be in the early stages of an apocalyptic spiritual famine? Join Dr. David Jeremiah for this special prophecy edition of Turning Point as he presents a sign of the end times. Spiritual famine, a spiritual prophecy. Today on Turning Point.
coming up on Turning Point. If we are not burdened enough to make the Bible central in our own lives, we got no reason to gripe. We've got no reason to complain. Let's make sure we start where we should start, and then God will give us the ability to influence the people around us, and we can make a difference. We need to be burdened. The Bible predicts the falling away of the church. Is that what we are seeing today? Are the illnesses, plagues, and pestilence of our day signs we are living in the end times? Would you be surprised to know the decay of character is a precursor for Christ's return? Dr. David Jeremiah answers these questions and more in his brand new prophecy book, Where Do We Go From Here? How Tomorrow's Prophecies Foreshadow Today's Problems. Written especially for this time, Dr. Jeremiah explores how Bible prophecy intersects with culture and events we are witnessing right outside our door. In every chapter, Dr. Jeremiah examines what Bible prophecy reveals about the world today, what it means for believers, and ultimately, where we go from here. Where Do We Go From Here by Dr. Jeremiah is yours when you give a gift of any amount in support of this program. And if you give $75 or more, you'll receive the Where Do We Go From Here set, which also includes Dr. Jeremiah's entire teaching series on CD or DVD, a correlating study guide, and his interview special on DVD. Plus, included with any order of the book or set, Warning Signs of the End Times a fascinating overview of the cautionary evidence that signals the coming of the last days. Order Where Do We Go From Here, book or set today.
For more than three decades, David Jeremiah and Turning Point have delivered the unchanging Word of God to an ever-changing world. Through radio, books and print resources, television and online, people around the world have received the gospel, the strength and encouragement to help them through their greatest trials, and consistent Bible-strong teaching for their walk with God. And it has only been possible with the help of our Bible-strong partners. Our Bible-strong partners are dedicated supporters of David Jeremiah and Turning Point, whose gifts help Turning Point reach more souls across the globe and continue to come to you on this network. And you can join the thousands of Bible-strong partners today. Your dedicated support will help deliver the unchanging Word of God to an ever-changing world. Plus, as a Bible Strong partner, you will receive monthly resources handpicked by Dr. Jeremiah to encourage and strengthen your own walk with God. To become a member or to find out more information, go to davidjeremiah.org forward slash Bible Strong. Does your devotional life need a turning point? David Jeremiah's exclusive monthly magazine and devotional may be what you're looking for. Each issue of Turning Points is centered around a unique spiritual theme based on David Jeremiah's teachings. Inside, you will find inspiring articles from David Jeremiah taken from God's Word. Study inspirational daily devotions to aid you in your quiet time with God. Discover a complete schedule of Turning Points radio and television broadcasts so you never miss a show. Join more than 300,000 subscribers who support the ministry of Turning Point around the world. Sign up for your copy of this free monthly resource today. I saw the Lord Served me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on him and are radiant, they'll never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. This poor man cried. Save me from my enemies, the Son of God, surrounds his saints, he will deliver them, he will deliver them. Oh! 
Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. May our incense rise. Let us bless the Lord. Dr. David Jeremiah's new prophecy study, Where Do We Go From Here? Discover 10 phenomena happening in our world today that prove tomorrow's prophecies, foreshadow the problems we are experiencing in our culture, and find biblical direction for the end times. In this book, Dr. Jeremiah examines what Bible prophecy reveals about 10 issues of our time, what they mean for believers, and ultimately, where we go from here. Where Do We Go From Here by Dr. Jeremiah is yours when you give a gift of any amount in support of this program. And if you give $75 or more, you'll receive the Where Do We Go From Here set, which also includes Dr. Jeremiah's entire teaching series on CD or DVD, a correlating study guide, and his interview special on DVD. Plus, included with any order of the book or set, Warning Signs of the End Times, a fascinating overview of the cautionary evidence that signals the coming of the last days. Order Where Do We Go From Here, book or set today. Thank you for watching Turning Point. In appreciation of your viewership, Dr. Jeremiah would like to send you Warning Signs of the End Times, a fascinating overview of the cautionary evidence that signals the coming of the last days. It's yours absolutely free, just by contacting Turning Point today. And now, here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message, Spiritual Famine, a Spiritual Prophecy. When actor Benedict Cumberbatch took on the role of Greville Wynne in the movie The Courier, he faced some scenes that required him to endure severe weight loss. The movie was inspired by real events, and Wynne was an English businessman recruited by MI6 and the CIA to spy against Russia during the Cold War. When Wynn was captured by the Soviets, he spent a few years in lockup, and his near-starvation diet reduced him to skin and bones. For about four scenes in this movie, Cumberbatch had to replicate the look of a man nearly starved to death. And the movie's crew took a break from filming while he went on a harsh diet to make him look emaciated for this portion of the movie. It was a brutal experience. 
you get very disoriented, he said. You feel dehydrated. You feel hungry all the time. You feel emotionally and physically vulnerable. It's horrible. He said, I felt mentally unstable. Have you ever wondered why our world seems so hungry all the time? Why we are perpetually thirsty? Why so many people are emotionally and physically vulnerable? Why they feel horrible? Why they seem mentally unstable? The answer is that our generation is on a diet. It's a generation that is famished. We have been starved for truth. We're hungry for hope and thirsty for the God-given message of the Scripture. And what we're experiencing right now, which we'll get into in a little bit, is something that the Bible teaches would happen. The Bible says there will be a famine of truth in the last days. Did you know that was in the Bible? The most vivid biblical prediction about this comes from the rugged prophet Amos. He wasn't a trained preacher or an educated theologian. He was a herdsman who spent most of his time trying to figure out where his sheep were. He also was a fruit picker, Amos the fruit picker. He churned with courage and he spoke with conviction because he knew his God and his homespun message was so direct. Amos 4.12 says this, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. When I read that recently, I was reminded of the many trips my family and I took across this country when I was growing up and you would see that up on billboards, prepare to meet your God. And it was not just a few times, it was all over the country. I recall seeing this painted on rocks and signposts along the highway when I was growing up. Now, of course, they've almost disappeared from our consciousness, and people take offense at that and probably would go to jail if they put it up there where people could see it. And they didn't like it in Amos' day either. We often think we're different than history. When Amos said this, he didn't win any awards, I promise you. In fact, in the New Living Translation of Amos 7, 12 through 13, here's what we read. Get out of here, you prophet, they said. Go on back to the land of Judah and earn your living by prophesying back there. Don't bother us with your prophecies here in Bethel. This is the king's sanctuary and the national place of worship. When Amos told them to prepare to meet their God, they didn't like it. They told him to get lost. They didn't know with whom they were dealing. This southern farmer wouldn't be intimidated. Instead, he met their threats with this piercing prediction, Amos 8, 11, and 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord and they shall not find it. Amos was describing a particularly deadly type of famine, a problem of the ears, not the stomach. Our generation may be the early stages of a hearing famine as another layer of biblical prophecy unfurls. And this isn't the only time that this is in the Bible. This isn't just Amos' word by himself. Listen to what the prophet Ezekiel said. He said, disaster will come upon disaster and rumor will be upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. And the prophet Micah answered with these words, therefore you shall have night without vision. You shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be dark for them. Here are the prophets describing a time in the future almost as difficult to understand as the 400 silent years that transpired between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And as you look around today, if you're vigilant, if you're sensitive to what's happening in the religious world at all, it sort of feels like those days are beginning to come upon us. Everywhere you turn, people are running to and fro, trying to find where significance might be, trying to find satisfaction. They've lost their appetite for the objective truth of God's Word, and so it's being replaced with positive mental attitude lessons and motivational lessons and all kinds of cute little things to try to get people to come and sit in the seats in the church. But it's not the absence of the Word of God that's troubling. 
Do you know that there are Bibles aplenty in most of the world? And a virtual army of Bible translators are working night and day to get the Scripture into every tongue. And we've made great strides across the universe. More than 1,500 languages now have access to the New Testament, and Bible translation work is currently being done on the rest. Missionary and translation societies are focusing now on the 1.5 billion people who do not have the entire Bible in their language, working feverishly to meet their need. If you ever go to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, you will see a room where they have cataloged all the languages of the world and where you can figure out by just walking in there what languages are yet to be translated with the Bible as its subject. And of course, what that means, men and women, is that about 6 billion of the earth's 7.6 billion people now have access to the whole Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. In other words, God's Word has never been more accessible, and in many places in the world, it's only a smartphone or a laptop click away. So what was Amos talking about when he said there's going to be a famine of the hearing of the Word of God? The prophet's warnings concerned a loss of hunger for the truth. This is a self-inflicted famine. I'll never forget the impact a little book had on my life some years ago. It was written by Sherwood Elliott Wirt. He wrote a little book called A Thirst for God. I read it when I was just getting started in ministry, just getting going as a preacher. It's basically a commentary on Psalm 142. And he said that one of the problems we have when we talk about spiritual hunger is that we think that spiritual hunger and physical hunger are exactly alike, but they are as diverse from each other as they could be. For instance, spiritual hunger works just exactly the opposite from physical hunger. When we are physically hungry, we eat and satisfy our appetites and cease to be hungry. But when we are spiritually undernourished, and are then given a feast of good spiritual food, it makes us hungrier than ever. So the more we learn about God's love, the more we want to know we can't get enough. And the reverse is also true. When we are physically hungry and miss a meal, our appetite becomes ravenous. But in time, it passes. And if we receive no spiritual food in that period of time, we lose our appetite. You get it? When you're hungry physically, you get more hungry. But if you don't satisfy your spiritual hunger for a period of time, your hunger quotient goes down. You get less hungry. And that's a real problem because let's suppose you've lost your appetite for the Word of God. Suppose you don't really desire it. Suppose you get up in the morning and you see your Bible. You you know, I should read this, but I don't do that anymore. used to do it a long time ago, but I just don't really desire it. But then one day you realize you're missing something and you need to fix the problem. So what do you do? How do you fix a problem of spiritual lack of hunger for the Word of God? Here it is. It's called force feeding. (laughs) You know what that is? You go into your little closet, your little study, your little desk, and you sit down and you say to yourself, Self, I'm going to read the Bible today. I don't care if I get anything out of it or not. I'm going to read it. In fact, I'm going to read it till I get something out of it. You have to rekindle your appetite so that your appetite will grow. If you just stop reading the Bible and don't do anything about it, you will never again have an appetite for the Word of God, and you will be a part of the spiritual famine that Amos was talking about. The reality is that our hearts are easily drawn away from God and His Word. We know that. Human beings have a terrible habit of losing their appetite for the truth. D.A. Carson wrote these words. Here's what he said. He said, apart from grace-driven effort, People do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. It's not natural to go there. We drift toward compromise, and we call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience, and we call it freedom. We drift toward superstition, and we call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control, and we call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking that we've just escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. We play these games, don't we, in our minds. We all know it. All of us do it. I have done it. The integrity of our own mind is at stake here. 
if we're going to maintain a spiritual appetite. So what does this mean? That's where we are. What does it mean? I know there are some who are listening who will wonder about the inclusion of a chapter like this in a prophecy book. After all, most of the other topics that I talk about in this series are sort of cataclysmic or apocalyptic in nature. The COVID-19 pandemic, the threat of socialism, economic danger poised to crush all resistance during the tribulation. But what we see prophesied in the book of Amos and other passages of Scripture is nothing less than spiritual starvation. It's a crisis affecting not only our bodies but our souls. To appreciate the serious nature of this coming spiritual famine, I want you to go with me and let's dig a little deeper into its implications. What does it mean for the last days? What does it mean for our lives right now? Here are four things our culture is currently under threat from spiritual malnutrition. First of all, our heritage is being lost. We're losing our heritage. The psalmist said, you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Hear me now carefully. How many children in Sunday school and church know anything about the 2,000 years of Christian history? Where are the missionary stories? What's happened to the heroes and martyrs and stalwarts of the past whose courage brought the gospel to us? How many children grow up learning the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer? And what has happened to our old hymns? Our spiritual heritage is little by little just slipping away. We all know that, and it frustrates us. Number two, our theology is being weakened. We must also guard our theology because it's easy for churches to become malnourished in times of spiritual famine. George Barna and his researchers issued a 2020 report warning American Christians are undergoing a post-Christian reformation. The irony of the reshaping of the spiritual landscape in America is that it represents a post-Christian reformation driven by people seeking to retain a Christian identity. The most startling realization is how many people from evangelical churches are adopting unbiblical beliefs. You see, if you don't lay a foundation down of what true doctrine is and teach people what theology is all about, if we don't stand for something, we fall for anything. And they fall for whatever comes down the road. They don't have anything to measure it by, so it sounds good, and they buy it. The report went on to say that evangelicals have traditionally emphasized the importance of seeing the Bible as the infallible, inerrant Word of God. But now, today, 52%